I think we should start right now, and we're just gonna, I'm gonna put it up there. Inshallah. So, I'm so just, okay, so a lot of people will be new. So this is their first time. Okay. 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 Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Rasha. Wa alaikum, assalamu wa rahmatullah. How's everybody? Alhamdulillah. Um, can men join this yeah. class? Yes, everybody can join. So I am aware that there could be men in the background. So. All right, all right. Yeah. Thank you. So Salaam I'm alaykum. just going to be muting everybody. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to be muting everybody just because we we do expect that uh, people, you know, hacking in and just to make sure that we're organizing the discussion. I'm going to be sharing a screen and that way it'll help us uh, it'll help us, you know, go through and, and navigate this topic in a way where it is organized. So today's topic is children and public schools or children and the schooling generally here in the West. Let's just, you know, our Muslim kids um, safe in the schools and how do we actually work about with that? It's not a lecture. I'm not going to be giving any lectures. I will be um, talking um, to you and we're going to be asking you to share your ideas and we're, we're just going to be learning from one another and how each and every single one of us was trying to um, raise her children in a in an environment that is one uh, based on at least you know Islamic principles. I know that the pandemic, you know, coming in kind of changed a lot of what we um, had thought was going to happen, you know, and how things were going to happen, and changed a lot of how we navigate within our schools and within our Islamic education, our children's Islamic education, and even their re relationship with the public and with the with a society around them. So we're still learning. So as we learn, you know, now we're going to hear some things and we're probably going to repeat this in probably um, in six months from now to see what your thoughts after doing, whether it's that hybrid style or whether it's online schooling or whether it's actually going um, in person in as at least uh, in some places they are going to school more frequently than than other schools so we'd like to hear your thoughts we'd like to you know share our experiences like i said i'm not going to be giving any lecture here it's just um you so the topics that we're going to be talking about um, they're uh, different topics, so we're the comparing between public and Islamic schools and online schooling. So if you have, you know, an experience you'd like to share in public schooling or, um, you know, there were pros and cons that you thought you or even challenges that you thought, you know, maybe I can hear somebody's opinion and how they went around those challenges. I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. My children are... Uh, my children are in, they used to be in Islamic school. One of my children is autistic, so he was in a public school because of the different needs. Um, my children, my children's Islamic school closed, shut down because of the pandemic. I guess, um, you know, they probably didn't have enough people or I'm not sure what the problem was, but they shut down. So my only choice was really online homeschooling. I must admit, I was... A lot more excited when I enrolled my kids but then until I got an email I got an email from the the that online homeschooling which is connection Academy connections Academy but then at the end of the email they had um, like a moto logo and it was talk it was it had a rainbow on it and it was talking about um, inclusiveness diversity tolerance and all that and which is pretty much the same kind of rhetoric that the lgbt use so that kind of scared me and i was like okay what am i going to be going through here what does that mean and it, it you know i was like okay it looks like i'm i'm gonna be needing to participate a lot more than i had expected so faiza you asked um to unmute you so faiza Go ahead, Faiza. Yes, um, just like you, when I last year I, I enrolled my my son Kais for high school, so he did uh, ninth grade at Connections Academy. Okay. And it was basically because I wanted to be able to um, guide him through his academic school year because he did really 
uh, poorly with his grades in eighth grade. So um, I had heard about it and I enrolled him in it. And I, when I saw that first email and I saw that, I said, oh my gosh, Yanni, what is, what is this? You know, and I was also, I became very, like, I had anxiety from that because I, that's, you know, I was afraid that they would implement it. Mm -hmm. So um, then as the year progressed and stuff, I realized and what I had started to hear from people was that the basis of this, the foundation of this school was mostly because, not just because people wanted to homeschool and they wanted uh, it to be less um, less in terms of like the parents teaching, but having having that option of having an actual teacher. It, it's very much for minorities and people that have been like students that have been bullied. Mm-hmm. And as we all know, because of that LGBTQ community, they, they tend to you know be from that group of people. So they really launched the school with that in mind. And you know because we never growing up in the in the U.S. We never really, they never really took bullying as seriously when we were younger as when um, the LGBTQ agenda came into the mainstream. That's when it became a zero tolerance. You know, we grew up here in Aisha, you know, we were bullied when we were young because of our religion. There wasn't that many Muslims here back then when we were in elementary school. But it really launched from that. So this was the the purpose. I, I believe that one of the main reasons that they launched this was because of that. However, I I was afraid that they would be implementing it. The nice thing, though, that I found about this school is that they they have so many activities for all of these types of things, and they just send you emails. You don't really need to participate in anything if you don't want to. It doesn't have any, it's just, and you get all of the emails that the students get, that your student gets. So it's not I didn't feel like they tried to um, push for anything or I haven't seen anything from what my son has has studied. It's just basic public school education. Um, I didn't see anything where I felt like it was pushed in or it was like highly, you know, there was like an agenda for it. It seems to be from what I've experienced more of we want to um, we, we want to include everybody and they use this as the catalyst. Mm-hmm. for that mm-hmm. um i really i but the the thing that that i liked about it is when you compare this to just the brick and mortar public schools is because they are at home is, and because they get a lot that they have to do i felt like with my son i was able to do a lot of activities that i chose for him outside of the house um to keep him busy then, and I don't think like he really cared for the stuff that they did um, uh, at Connections Academy. They do have field trips, like well, I don't think they do that now because of COVID. But um, they, it's not, it's not so much where it's all over. They even, you know, they have prom. They had prom last year, but they had it canceled. They do all of that stuff. But it's all about like they send the emails, and if you're interested, they send the emails, and you just sign up if you're interested. Whereas if you send your son, your son or daughter to public school, it's the environment, it's the, um, you know, everyone is talking about it, it's all over the school. You don't have that, there's not that presence of all of this culture if you don't choose to be involved with it. Mm-hmm. That is why I was like, okay, this is not too bad. Okay. So you, that's why you enrolled the rest of your kids? Well, I really, you know, Aisha, like you, you know, I had my kids in the private school and they closed the school. So, and then the sixth, the, the one going to sixth grade, there was no fifth grade. So I really didn't know what to do. And I figured, to, I figured, you know, there really is no point for me to worry about. They're closing the schools down in a month and then we, we need to now transition them to fully online. So I said, you know, I tried it last year. I might as well bite the bullet and, you know, put them all in there and not have to deal with like transitioning and okay, let's move them in. At the end of the day, I figured that this is something that has been uh, 15 years, I think. It's a 15 years it's been uh, running. So they've got it all down. Instead of sitting there and waiting for the public schools to figure out how to do online learning in this, in this, you know, with in, in, at this level. 
So, so how much time um, do you invest in teaching your children? Like, how do you mentor them? Um, you can you repeat that question? Like, how do you mentor your your kids while they're homeschooling and doing your your home tasks? You know, cooking and cleaning and doing all that stuff. So the nice thing about it is, it's they have like one uh, one to two live lessons a day. So technically, they can do their schoolwork any time of the day they want. It's very flexible. They mm -hmm. can stay up at night and do it. They can wake up early in the morning and do it. My son was very flexible. The, the nice thing is, so we would let him know that, like, they don't have to to attend the live lessons, but they get extra credit for it. So if they're, they tend to do not so well on tests or in assignments, it always makes up for it when they're, they're at the live lessons. And the, the teachers, they take the students more seriously and they feel like they, they care more and they're more responsible. So they help them more when they see them that they're, you know, consistently attending these live lessons. Other And usually the live lessons are like between like 10 in the morning to 12 p.m. Mm -hmm. And so we just always made sure for my son that he would attend these live lessons. And then um, he was basically, he liked to do uh, have a schedule for himself and start in the morning. And, um, and then, you know, just go so that he can get everything done as early as possible in the day and he can relax for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. But it's very flexible in terms of, like, when they decide to do it, besides these live lessons, they're at a certain time. And they can also, by the way, watch live lessons as recorded. But mm -hmm. you're not, they're not going to get uh, the full credit as they would if they were there attending the live lessons. Okay, so um, here, by the way, just for those that are wondering, what is she talking about? So she's talking about, it's called Connections Academy. It's an online, um, it's an online homeschooling, public schooling slash public schooling. And what you can do is that um, it basically, you know, helps you, helps you do both, which is public schooling, and it is accredited. And at the same time, you're also doing online homeschooling. So if you can give us an idea um, Faiza, for those that don't know, this is not to promote Connections Academy, but this is to help those that are seeking um, alternatives, um, alternatives to public schools. So with Connections Academy that you talked about, I know there's another one that's called K-12, but you work with the Connections Academy. So yeah. just, you know, there, we're just... There's, there's plenty of them. And uh, my brother's wife works for Minnesota Online School. It's called Minnows. Um, and she she also said has I asked her about it. She says that the thing is I think Connections Academy was a fe is a federal program. Mm -hmm. They have it in several states. Um, they have it in several states, so I think it's federally funded. Mm -hmm. A lot, and then states also within the states they they also have funds as well. So this one is the longest running one I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing about it is like instead of that traditional you're sitting at home and you get the books and you're the mom and you teach, this is, it's all done for you and you just guide them. So you check um, in order for your your student to, when they do the assi their assignments and they turn in their homework, they cannot fully turn it in until you check mark it. So it, it'll stay pending. And then like the nice thing about it is the, the, the program that they have um, that you're, the parent is dealing with or the learning coach, which is like the parent or whoever decides to go and guide them through it, is that you, they take you through every single step. It's not like, oh, I, it, I'm not, I don't know what to do or I did something wrong. It's really, they made it very simple. And um, another thing I wanted to add is that my son, because he has a very um, introverted personality, he, and he's not very, he's not loud and he's not, he doesn't, he doesn't have so much charisma like other students. When he was in school, he went to a charter school before and he went to public schools in the past. He always tended to fall through the cracks. The teachers forget about him. They don't really notice him. So he always didn't, he didn't really do well throughout school. He easily fell, fell through the cracks. He easily was forgotten about. He wasn't noticed if he was doing bad. Um, and then the nice thing about it when he went to Connections is this, the teachers, they're always, they have, they, they connect with the students all the time, one-on-one. -on -one. If they feel like your student is falling behind, they will call the parent or the learning coach to let you know. Um, and it's not like, okay, now you have to get, get there and go look at his homework or go look at his schoolwork. No, they'll just tell you, I just want you to know that he hasn't been turning these things in. 
and then you go and you tell them, okay, so you look at all of his stuff on your from your phone even. And it's just you basically guiding them. Mm-hmm. And it's very nice how they have it done. Right, right. So um, what are what are some of the things that, you know, sometimes you felt that were hard to do and you felt that, oh, I'm not sure if this is this is the best way to do it. And let's say what are the, the places of weakness that you would like to share? It's definitely you. It's <coughs> as, as a mother, I mean, you really have to be at home. You have to be there. You have to be you know, on track, you have to be um, just like, okay, you, you have to be, it really re- revolves around your students. So it's not like, okay, just do it, whatever. Because if you're, if you're, you're ch- well, this is how it is for me, but if your child is not on track, if they see you that you're not structured and you're not on track and you, you don't care, they don't care. They will not care. It's just more of you need to let, let them know and they need to understand that, look, okay, this is what we're doing today. So it really, basically, the, the, the hardest thing about it is that I had to sacrifice my life, and I kind of explained to myself that, okay, you're doing this for, for, your, for your child. And I really basically, like, had to make sure that I had to put him on a schedule. And, and this is just my son, because he easily gets distracted. He needs to have structure for him to be focused. So that was very hard for me, because I basically had to, like, I was technically, I had to have a schedule so that I could, ensure that he did well mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's well, well and sure. also i have to add that i didn't want him to feel because we're at home and now with covid it's you know like it's harder to be out there out, outdoors or you know to have like the social interactions so i i also was you know putting him in activities so i put him in basketball and i put him in uh, martial arts and so i was doing all of that on the side so that he he doesn't feel like, oh, I have, I don't see anybody, or I, you know, because he, in general, he is very introverted, and I always didn't want him to, you know, I wanted him to always have that social interaction in his life so that it doesn't kind of like backfire. Mm-hmm. Love that, love that. So you were making up for the social skills that he would have learned at school by making it up in other programs around um yeah. in, in different areas that was very smart um Faiza, oh, I mean, did you want to add anything else before yeah we... i also um i i i just you know i took it to the next level and i did i actually had assigned a gym membership and i would we would wake up in the morning and i would actually go with him to the gym and we would either walk at the gym you know so it was and and this year now with my three we're um, I have a schedule where it would be in the morning because it's very good for brain function to just have some sort of an exercise in the morning. Mm-hmm. So I basically took it as a project. Yeah, and so this with these three, they know that once school starts every morning, we're going to take a 30-minute walk. So they, so they know this. This is happening. You have to put them in that mood and in that schedule. And I felt, felt like that was the best way to to get them in on a structured schedule to know that this is not just we're sitting around at home no we are in school mode um and uh, so and they also on the side they do islamic school on the weekends and now i did a lot of arabic lessons and islamic studies lessons for my for my oldest as well uh through zoom so there's a lot that we're doing on the side just to make up for it because i didn't want them to feel like we are just sitting around at home. It's very hard when they're at home. They start to, they can easily get into that mood of I'm just sitting around at home. And that's why I felt like it was very important to have that, like to structure that time. Beautiful, beautiful. That that was great. You know, Faiza, you have really fascinated me. That was great. That was great. You know, I'll let other people, um, if they want to ask questions um, for Faiza, you know, because she definitely has experience and she's here you know, talking to us through experience. It's not, it's not theory. So if you have any questions for Faiza, um, you'd like to raise your hand. I'll keep Faiza unmuted. And if you have any questions for her, you can actually ask her. Or if anybody wants to share their experience as well, please do so. So just raise your hand and we'll, inshallah, unmute. Um, so let's, um, let me ask you another question. Faiza, we, we both went to public school. How is public schooling different than that on the the pros and the cons so how is it how is it different and why do you 
why did you necessarily think that online schooling was going to be helpful for your child? Yes. Um, so the, 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 the thing that I don't like about public school is that social environment. It's um, and I and I have this this theory of like it really depends on the personality of your child, but I don't like that social environment and the way that peer pressure influences them to have these you know to to have a certain uh, you know the certain ideas and the, the things. It's really like an indoctrination, you know. Um, I don't like it. It's and you know like when we used to think it was bad back in the the 80s and 90s. I mean, I and now it's probably like magnifying worse you know um that the the pro of that of the online school is that you're controlling that environment you're controlling the social network you're controlling who the friends are you're controlling where you want them to go and socialize whereas at school i have somebody that um i know from my family that sent their uh son to a high school in, our, in, in an area that is predominantly, it's just, let's just say it's less diverse because we went, um, Aisha, to a diverse, we went to right. diverse pub, uh, public high school. Mm -hmm. So somebody that I know, they, they sent their son to a mostly predominantly white. And so the, the son, he's my son's age, and he kind of was telling my son, like, if you're, he asked him how was it and everything he was asking him. And he said, you know, if you're not white, you're nobody. So this 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 um, this this uh, this boy, he would have to go to all of the football games because he wanted to be felt like that he was included, and he would and it was he actually uh, stopped hanging out with his group of friends that he grew up with because he was always just had to, became like I have to keep going to these football games because he was feeling that he was excluded at school, and in order for him to get in, you know to be no noticed he needed to go to all the football games and I don't know if I know what happens at these football games and it's it's a very dirty culture and so it, it that was something that was like okay and I explained that to my son a few times he asked him he's like can you come with and even though I know by personality my son is not he, he he's not comfortable going out of his comfort zone he's not by personality he's very reserved and he generally is a rule, rule follower, so he doesn't. He's not easily influenced. He doesn't feel comfortable doing things that he didn't grow up doing. But in the end, you know, too much of it it can change anybody. So he, when he would tell him, "Come with me to the football game," and I would say, "No, you cannot go. This is not a good environment to be in." So it was like this type of culture. Even he started to say, "Like this, you know, my friend, he's not hanging out with us anymore. He just wants to go to the football game." And I explained to him, I'm like, because this is what it is. You can never be from that group of people unless you do what they do. And so it's very, it's very difficult. That was, that's the one of the pros of having them at home. Um, the con is that you really have to be on top of it. it uh, if you know, you really have to keep them socializers, and you really have to, you know, there has to be structure because they can just easily be like, you know, not care about it. Mm-hmm. 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 That was very important information, um, Faiza. And I know that Um Amira, I believe she also wanted to be unmuted. So Um Amira, I'm trying to unmute you. So go ahead, Um Amira. Um Amira, what did you want to say? Okay, Um Amira, we can't hear anything. So if you... <clears throat> Um, if you can um, work out the microphone, that would be helpful, inshallah. Oh, wa alaikum salam. There she is. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yep. Yeah, um, uh, Sister Fatima Osman uh, or Um Amira, you know, go ahead, Sister Um Amira. Uh, um, I believe your connection, uh, your connection, your internet connection is not that good. So if you can fix your internet connection. So Sister Fatima Osman, go ahead. Okay. Uh, give me a minute, please. 
حلو حلو السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله آه. I like the subject. I don't know. My concern may, may be a little bit different. What I'm saying is uh, the big concern I have is in public school, when they change the curriculum, why we as parents do not, uh, what kind of voice can we, how can our voice can be heard? Especially the, the, the changes in related to gender issue. We know we know gender issues are different. People can follow, can do the way they want. Nobody, we cannot stop. We can, people can teach them, can tell them what is good, what's not good. But we cannot tell our innocent offspring who come in my great, great children, something not exists, something didn't come from there. To teach them, this is that, this is okay to be like that. This is okay, you are Muslim, but it can be different than yeah? What kind of, who we are, what, why we as parents stand and listen for this? How far are we going to go like this? If you say now I'm going to teach my home, if you care only about your kids, you're going to teach your ability to teach them at home. No, we cannot see, we can it's not only that. You have to think about other kids, other kids also, not only Muslim, all kind of kids, innocent kids. We have to keep the truth is the truth. Why we don't do anything to make no, you cannot teach our kids like that. No. This is Allah's creation. That's how we came generations to generations up to this. If they don't scared to 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 make changes, to teach uh, our kids like this, why we fear not to to bring the truth? Why we are afraid of it? Well here's the thing is our that what um, should be heard. Uh Sister Fatima Osman, let, let me let me um just I don't wanna use the word respond but I'll tell you what other people might say is that they'll tell you well you know public schools when we're talking about public schools there is an education or so-called education system that governs the public education and what they are taught so and as a Muslim minority we're definitely not going to have the power to currently um, change any um, any uh, or at least the major issues in public schooling, because you've got lobbies that are way stronger than the Muslim community deciding on what is to be taught in school and what education looks like. And th right now we're, we're dealing with the, with, with the issue where my children, and I can't necessarily just, you know, change the system right now. So not until the system changes, Am I going to necessarily wait and and I need to I need to figure out my children's my children's life for now because time is passing by. When will the system change? Allahu alam. But right now my children are growing up and I have to make sure that my children are not absorbed in the system and say, well, I was waiting for the system to change. I'm hoping that if I would put them in public schools that they will be able to change the system. And that's the question. Is it is the way to change the public schools and all the different indoctrination that's happening going to be changed by me putting my children in a public school? That's another, that's a question. What do you think? When we're talking about time, it's, it's, it's passing by and um, go ahead. I, I yes. I, 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 what do you think about that? Hello? Yep. Are you talking to me? Yes, I'm. Yep, I'm basically asking you what do you. I, I'm outside. I'm not here with the good. I just want to throw my, my concern outside it like that. We people, as parents, as people, I'm not saying as Muslim or non Muslim, as parents, as, you know, any uh, citizens, we shouldn't. I, I don't know how we our can be heard best. All I am concerned about this issue in in future great 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 children we should just watch by by the scene it's not only by doing it by listening by do by doing not action we are one of them I don't know so, I think that's a big concern and I'm done well, I cannot hear you well sorry okay. Is that clear? Is that yeah, right? well, yeah, cool. So, um, by the way, there are 
there are board members for the different schools and then in the different uh the different areas they, they would have those board members and the board members would have their influence their influence and their say in in deciding a lot of the different curriculums but it, even the board members and even having that um uh, that Muslim voice, it doesn't necessarily mean yet that it is powerful enough to change different curriculums or to re demand a specific change. And in the end is that we're living right now, right now, what can we do? There's a whole difference between talking about something in 20 years or 10 years from now and talking about it right now, my son is growing. Right now, my son is eight or 10 or 12 years old. 10 years from now, if he's gonna be 22, it's going to be too late by then. So I have to figure out something as they grow older and what it means. So the change there, we definitely have to work on different ends, which is the political end and also the society end. But right now, as a mother, what should I do right now? So we're, we're gonna have different opinions um, laid out. So um, Faiza, what did you think about what she said? I was going to say that, unfortunately, we live in a secular, secularist society. Um, even there are many, there are many uh, white Americans, or I should say Westerners, that are conservative-minded, that they don't believe in all of these ideas being in these agendas being put, put into the schools, like um, you know the open openness of, of gender and all of that. So. In the end, it really is, I don't think we're at a point of time where we can have much of an influence on it. They do have like PTAs, like you said, and board meetings, but it really is a very strong and lobbied, um, it, there's an, a, a very strong agenda for it. And unfortunately, as minorities, we I don't think it's something that will do much of a difference at our point of time right now. And like you said, I agree that it really i think i think the best that we can do is is teach our children and focus on on our children because before we know it like you said they'll be in their 20s and that this is not something that you can change within a few years or even a decade you know it's taken it's taken a lot a lot of decades for us to 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 become this secular as a as a, as a western country it was not this you know like once they have an agenda and they have the lobbies and they have the money to, to push these agendas. So it really is a, about that. However, there is one thing that I wanted to add, and I this is from experience about how my father um, raised us and just what I've seen because I'm the oldest of 10. And so you see, you tend to see a lot. You're, the older you are, and Aisha, you know this too because you're also the oldest. So you tend to see that your younger siblings and the influence and the things how they have been influenced growing up. Um, maybe I have influenced the ones that were closer in age to me, right under me. But there, and this is not just speaking for, for my sisters, but in general, this generation, there is one trend that I did notice that um, I, I feel it plays a very important uh, role in how your kids, uh, what, they, what their philosophies and their ideologies are about the world. And um, I truly, truly believe that w in, in these years, like the teenage years, um, friends, the, the friends of your children play a very important role in molding their view in the world. You can tell them. You can put them in these Islamic schools. You can um, constantly explain these things. But at the end of the day, you're a parent. And the kids, they tend to like to listen to their friends over their parents. And peer pressure is a very, very big influence. So I can say this, that I'm very, very uh, strict about my kids with who their friends are, how often they're out with their friends, um, how much friends play a role in their lives. It's, I'm very um, strict about that. I truly believe, like, if it just takes one, one friend of your child who had like what I would call a free range upbringing, free range as in like their parents just let them do whatever it is and maybe they're on the internet all day long, they just have a bunch of different friends and they don't really um, look over to see what's going on. I tell, um, So it just takes one, one friend of your friends that will can flip your child 
and flip their ideology and flip everything that you worked on. I truly believe this. I've seen it, and I and and I've seen people that have their parents have limited them in terms of that extreme and always socializing, and how it has made a, played a big difference in how they have turned out. So here's a question: Somebody saying, "How much is it uh, to enroll kids in Connections Academy?" It's free. Um, it depends on the state that you're in, by the way. For and, for Minnesota, it's free. Right. For for Minnesota, I believe Chicago as well. Um, a number of other states are free. Um, southern states, they are uh, there are tuition. There is a tuition. I'm not sure how much it is, but um, so check with your check with your. So in in Minnesota, they also offer a one laptop rental per family, and it's a free rental for the year. And so we took advantage of that as well. We have a desktop, but we also, because now all three of my kids, um, we have, uh, we have, we also rented a laptop from them. Okay. They offer that. Yep. I, I did actually rent a laptop from them as well. Well, it's actually called renting, but you're actually not paying anything for it. Yeah. You're not paying for it. No. Yeah. You're not paying for it. You're just getting it for free. Um, but you got to make sure and remember that you will be required to um to pay for it if any any damage happens to it so just to keep that and somebody's asking which is better k-12 or connections uh Faisa, how much is it to enroll is it uh or what which one is which one did you think was better k-12 or connections if, can you repeat that question? Sorry, I had my son talking to me. Um, which is better, K-12 or Connections? K-12 as in public school, you mean? No, the, there's the K-12 um, online homeschooling and there's the Connections. Well, I, I, I don't have an experience with that. I've only tried Connections last year. Mm -hmm. my, my brother's wife, she works for another online school, and I had asked her, I asked her, and she said, she told me that she's like, they're all pretty good, they, they do really well, but she told me the strongest one, in terms of because they've had the longest running experience, is is Connections Academy. Okay. They oh they I think are the oldest out of them. Okay, is the oldest. Okay, so they're they're going to have the program pretty much. Um... And she also told and she also told me she says that she truly believes that online learning is going to be very big in the future mm -hmm. for because families are just opting out of sending their kids, you know, it's a lot of people have concerns about sending their, their kids out to public school. You don't even have to be religious or, or conservative minded, but you know, you don't know what's out there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There, It's going to, that, that's well, right now, um, it is definitely going to be very popular, especially with the pandemic. So yeah. Yeah. Um, so more, I'm going to um, unmute you. So I'm not sure what you wanted to say. So go ahead. Hi, um, Assalamu alaikum. Um, I just wanted to ask a question to Ms. Wesleth. I think she's the one who is talking about the right. the Islamic schools during the weekend, and she is homeschooling during the week. Oh, that's uh, actually um, Faiza. I just have a question. That's actually Faiza. By the way, we have similar voices, and I've had many people <laughs> confuse my voices because we're cousins. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's an honor to sound like so I did. Was... <laughs> you both sound very beautiful, mashallah. <laughs> um, question is, what kind of studies does an Islamic school offer exactly? Because if you're teaching them regular um, curriculum during the week, why exactly are you sending them during the weekend? I mean, like, what are they teaching? exactly in the Islamic school and another question or do you want to answer then I'll ask another one okay so in the Islamic school so my my kids they mm -hmm. were part of Al Tawasun. that was a weekend Islamic school it okay. was on Saturday it was on Saturdays and they were learning um, Arabic Quran and Islamic studies and because of the pandemic they switched everything to online so now they're going to have okay. home meetings um, and so it's very, um, it's just an advanced uh, Arabic and Quran and Islamic studies program. The curriculum is at the same uh, level as jo it is in Jordan. And I, I kept them in there because okay. uh, it's, uh, they've, they've benefited a lot from it, alhamdulillah. 
and my oldest son, uh, because oldest. this school, this this school for boys, it only goes up to sixth grade, and my oldest is in tenth. So one of the teachers, um, she offered she offered uh, private lessons, and it's like Arabic, Quran, Islamic studies, mm-hmm. one, two, or three of them. So I actually did um, I did lessons for him because he's been out of it for a while, and he's pretty rusty in his Arabic and his Quran. So, you know, we took advantage of the fact that everything is going to be online and at home this year. So I, I, mm-hmm. I basically, I basically signed him up with her to teach him through Zoom. So he'll be doing Arabic and Quran. Um, he also, I mm-hmm. used to send him, I used to do like Al Maghrib Institute. We would, I would take them and we would do those seminars when they would come in. And now they, they moved those mm-hmm. to online as well. Yep. Um, uh-huh. But I think okay, that, um, uh, l- let me add I'm one sorry. thing: is that the other type? So I put here two kinds of Islamic schools. There's the advanced, the advanced Islamic schools. The other type of Islamic mm-hmm. uh, Islamic schools is where they would have uh, the public school curriculum, just the curriculum. They would have the public school curriculum. In addition to that, they will have. Quranic studies, Islamic studies, they will teach like Sira, um, Arabi, and, uh, you know, some akhlaq in Islam, etc. So some things to kind of, um, you know, train and teach the kids in Islamic studies. They also do Salat al-Jama'ah together, like Salat al-Duhur would be Jama'ah together. Most Islamic schools will, uh, will have hijab mandatory um, for older girls. Um, most, mm-hmm. most, there is an Islamic school, an all girls Islamic school that I saw in Chicago, an all girls Islamic school, and I was I was really amazed in how they had an. They all, have an they have an all boys one too as well in Chicago. Yeah, right, they're actually right next mm-hmm. to each other. There's an all boys yeah. one and all girls one. Um, there is another Islamic school in where another type of an Islamic school where they would have the students do online Islamic schooling and then. Uh, or online public schooling, sorry, and then they would have um, the other, the other, or throughout the day, they they would be doing hifz Quran. I know that there's one in Chicago. It's called Iqra, and I know that we have one here in Minnesota, and that's Dar al Arqam, where they they would pretty much be doing the whole day just hifz Quran, and the program is like three years where they have to memorize all the Quran. They they would have teachers there, and. But they would have to work on their online homeschooling with their family. So the the teachers won't mentor them in that corner whatsoever. So, you know, just it's different programs. Every Islamic school works differently. I know there is Mm -hmm. one Islamic school that is um, that's um, an Islamic school, but it's um, what do they call those? Um, where you sleep in them, like with the dorms and everything. Boarding, boarding, boarding. boarding school. Yeah, there you go, boarding schools. Um, there's one in Chicago where the students are in a boarding school, in a boarding Islamic school, and the teachers, it's more of da'wah and tabligh, and the teachers would be teaching them the Qur'an, Islamic studies in, in all the different corners, fiqh, hadith, tafsir, etc., and with mathematics and English literature. Those were some of the topics that they focused on. So those are just different types of Islamic schools out there. Mm-hmm. So if you don't mind, may I ask another question? Mm-hmm. Um, so for both of you, why um, why do we have to integrate into a secular public school instead of funding maybe like a public Islamic school? All of the schools that you have mentioned, I have heard of them before, but I think they're pretty uh, tight-knit and I think uh, privatized. So why i mean um for example i went to a catholic school and it was a a public uh, catholic school and let's say the jewish people they have their own public schools all around devon in chicago where i'm at like why don't muslims i guess have that same curriculum for their children or isn't there a way to combine um or publicize islamic studies along with regular curriculum so, um, Faiza, I'll let you answer one, one segment of it, but let me answer one of them. Is that public schooling, in order to be a public school, 
in order mm -hmm. to get the funding for it there are certain conditions in order for you to get the public the the federal funding so you can't be public and at the same time be private just because they're contradictory in order for you mm -hmm. to get the funding from the government that would and that would mean that you have to accept certain certain curriculums you have to accept certain um, certain agendas, let's say it that way, even though it's not going to be called an agenda, but they will say, well, these are these are the conditions for you to get public uh, the the government and federal funding. This the funding. This is what you need to. This is what you need to include in your education system, and in your in your little um, in in your institution. So if you don't include that in your institution, you won't get that federal fund funding. In order to not include that, um, not include that um, those ideas or those curriculums, which are called curriculums, that's when you have to be p private. If you don't want to get the funding, then you would have to be private. In order to be private and run any institution, you're going to need to um, you're going to need to charge the students or the families in order to make sure that the that the that institution is still going to make sure that the institution is still going you need the money for it so that's why you need donations but here's the thing is that managing any type of a private institution especially educational institutions um the the tuition only covers 25 percent this is not me really saying but this is you know in in general um this is what we're you know, we're talking about different institutions jewish christian muslim etc the the student tuition only covers 25 percent approximately 25 percent of the different um the different uh the funding or you know how to make how to make this school running so that's why you're going to need a lot of donations in order to complete the rest of that 70 or 75 percent needed to complete that now the jewish communities the jewish and christian communities i think because of their presence in the west you know been a lot longer their understanding of the system is a lot better and that's why they're beautifully funded, even though it might not be as expensive. Yet the Muslim community doesn't really yet know that in order to run any educational institution, the, the tuition is not enough to cover. That it is not like a business. Most of the people that, that enroll their children most of them, they would think that hey, it's like a business. It's like any other business in where, yeah, I've got, um, I've got enough students therefore this money should be paying for the teachers they look at it as if it's a business but that's not actually how it goes because when you're making a business you're depending on people's needs but the students the students are usually um you know not necessarily coming from the upper class but most of the students are coming from the low middle class and most of the times they don't really have that money to enroll their their students if we are wanting the tuition to cover up all the the needed all the needed money to make the school running so in order to make the tuition feasible you want to you know make sure that it's within at least the middle class middle class ability to pay so that's the problem is that when you're looking at wealth money the money side the budget and you're also looking at not wanting to not take the funding from the federal uh, federal government or the federal go federal funding in order to maintain your private institution as you want it that's why you know you 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 you're you need, you're going to work around money and around and around the community and what they're able to do most of the muslim most of the muslim community is actually within the lower lower class and not the upper class which means they do if we are to raise the tuition majority of the people are not going to be able to afford it so right now most islamic schools are with it within the range of 500 a month uh 500 a month 550 600 dollars a month most families that's a that that's that's too high and can't afford it 
most Muslim families are actually on the lower end within their finances. Oh. Mm -hmm. Sorry, my mom's about mm -hmm. to go and Thank uh, you. we'll see. Uh, so, Faiza, take it. Uh, Faiza, take over, and I'm just going to Assalamu alaikum. She's about to go to Palestine. So, um, oh, Allah is me. So, Faiza, you answer your side. What do you think of that? Honestly, Aisha did such a good job in answering it. Like, she said everything. It, it's very, it's actually, it, it's very, very costly. It's very costly to have these schools. Um, even, and in, in she covered everything, to be honest. It's, these, these like the, the Jewish community and the Christian community have been here for so long. They also have, they also have connections with these lobbies, these organizations that even out of Europe, you can imagine like these Christian academies, they get a lot of sponsorship from like Christian organizations and certain lobbies that push for this, push for Christian, Christian conservative, conservatism and, um, you know, just all of this stuff. So, uh, just the other day, one of my uh, our neighbors they go they go to a Christian private school, and I asked I asked the, the uh, I asked the kid I was like, yeah, what school do you go to? And he said Maranatha. So I went and I googled Maranatha uh, Christian Academy, and I was looking at the tuition. And Subhanallah, like their t the tuition for these schools is like you know for ten thousand dollars a year per student. Whereas for like these these uh, Muslim private schools, it's like six thousand dollars, and these schools that they have are like very big, very nice, very lavish, and everything. And not to be discriminatory, but or stereotypical, um, this is a this uh, this kid that's our neighbor. His mother is a single mother, so I was very curious that how could a single mother afford to send, you know, her son and her daughter. And she, you know, to a private school and pay twenty thousand dollars a year. But you also have to remember these uh, these schools, these Christian private schools, and these Jewish ones. They also do sponsorships and scholarships, and they get these funds from organizations, and they give them to certain, you know, they they allow them to certain family minority groups, uh, single parent families. We don't have that, like Aisha explained. We do not have that yet. As Muslims, we're still minority. Minorities in this country we have a, we're at a lower uh, income level as a, as a collective. So it's very, very hard. This will take generations, generations to be able to be at that level. And also, if you look at it, like Chicago has a lot of these schools. Chicago has a very, very old Muslim um, community. It's one of the earlier settled communities where Muslims came in. So they've already had, they're already, you know, off, starting off this, uh, um, they're, they're at the point right now where they're able to have all of these boarding schools and these private schools. And even, even with that, they don't have the funding, like if it was a Christian school or a Jewish school, it's, it's a lot, it's very, very old, deep rooted in, in, um, in the West. That they they are they have a lot more funds than we do. Um, um, sometimes I would think, Faiza, it's not necessarily that they have a lot more funds. I think um, they understand the importance of funding yeah, in education. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Muslims are still are still so um, so narrow in their understanding. They would fund you know, with lots and lots of money and put a minaret and all that for a masjid and not realize that the masjid, you're only staying there for, you know, Salat al Jumma is the only time that it's filled. But I agree, that, I agree. That's very empty. true. Very true. It's, it's, you know, it's mainly empty. But if you are to fund a school, you are you are going to actually fund maintaining the masjid. That's where funding the masjid starts. Yes. Funding the masjid starts and, from funding schools and Islamic schools. That's where it starts. When you're building then, that mentality, you're building that, that foundation, that Muslim um, from the school, not from the masjid. Can we agree then, though, that because it's very much so like a lot of the immigrant culture, they still they can't see that far. And, the, and like you said, they don't understand the system. So the more, the more deeper and the, the, the more that the generation gets, um, we have the new generations come in, they're, they're more understanding of the system and how these things work. And this is why like cities like Chicago, 
they they already have a very old community so now they're um they're they're more active i feel like they they're more they understand how these things work so they're able to open so much more i feel like we're our community here is still in its baby phases Mm -hmm. So here's a question. What's um, charter school? Are are they private um, but government funding? Um, You want to answer that one, Faiza? What I know is that charter schools are basically, essentially, they're public schools. They're very, there's a lot of parents involvement. My kids went to a charter school. It was called Star of the North Academy. It's up in uh, East Bethel. It's uh, predominantly Muslim. I I would say it's about 98% Muslim. Um, and they still have the curriculum that is the, the public, you know, the public schools have. The parents can, um, they can have a say in certain things about what they teach. There are, we have been to the, the, the meetings with the teachers and we were able to, um, at one point a few years back, they wanted to teach dance. That was part of the, the Minnesota curriculum. And we, we as parents came in and we said we would not like to teach, um, to have them be taught that. We asked for an alternative program and they did change the, they changed it. They were able to ask for an alternative program and they did something else. That's the thing about charter schools. There's more of a say than the public schools. You know, the parents can be more involved in certain things and how they, they turn up. So Rania, Rania, I'm going to unmute you, Rania, because I know that, um, uh, you're a teacher and you actually, I hope you can un- get unmuted. I know you have children around probably. So Rania says, charter schools are public. And um, Rania, did you, Rania, okay, go ahead, Rania. What did you want to say? You're, you're a teacher yourself, so you know the system. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was going to say the exact same thing. Pretty much that charter schools are uh, public schools. and So they, they can't teach religion. They can't teach language, though. Um, and oftentimes, it's the parents who develop that charter that have a big say in how the school runs. Um, so they can pick the different programming, they can pick the activities, the languages. Um, but yeah, it's still a, a it's still a public school essentially. So they they can teach religion. They can teach religion. No, they cannot teach religion. They cannot it's teach against religion. the law. Yeah, it's against they, the law. So they, because they still receive government funding, mm-hmm. um, it's it's unique because parents still have a say in how the curriculum is designed and what they get to teach. But they cannot teach religion because it is government funded. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the pub, the charter schools, um, if let's say they do an after school, um, after school Islamic studies um, lessons, are they allowed to do that, or is that not allowed? They're not. No, not even in, so. The same facility that they have the charter school operating in cannot be used, be used for any religious instruction or services. Okay. Okay. Like they can teach Arabic after school. They have many like Arab speaking or like Muslim, Muslim students. They can teach Arabic, but they cannot teach Islamic studies. Okay. Okay. So yeah. that, that's an idea because, and that this is really important to keep in mind. So if they can't and, use... So, and I think the, re- the reason why many parents will gravitate towards like a, a, a Muslim filled charter school is because they find that the environment still resembles something like an Islamic school. And they might say that, you know, even if my child's not getting Islamic education, they're still in a setting where there are many Muslims around them, and so they get to interact with Muslim children, they get to see Muslim families, um, and so there's a there's more of like a, a respect for the Muslim community, even if they can't get instruction on Islamic studies in that facility. So th- there there is a, a pro, but I wouldn't say that it it can be replaced. Like it, it cannot replace Islamic school setting, unfortunately. Mhm. Mhm. Okay. Okay. So um, what did you do to decide for your kids' schooling, um, Rania? Well, I have one son, alhamdulillah, he's turning four this weekend. Okay. And I think because he's, he's still he's not, he's still, he's preschool age now. And I figured that because it's not mandatory, I'll just keep him at home, inshallah, and teach him myself. Um, I have a, a preschool curriculum that I purchased online and kind of like homemade flashcards and whiteboards and, and different tools. And so I'm hoping to do my own instruction this year and then hopefully next year find something for him for kindergarten. Um, my husband, he pushes for Islamic school or homeschooling. Um, so right now, I, I, I kind of lean towards homeschooling, but it depends on my situation next, next year. So, Ronya, you know, I'm glad you're on the mic. Ronya, you taught in public schools, and you also taught in an, in an Islamic school, I believe, for two years. I did, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. What grades were the students that you taught? So I taught um, Islamic Studies Elementary for about four years, 
Mm -hmm. um, I taught weekend school as well as weekday school, both at Amal and Pioneers Academy. Which are, and I also taught, which are Islamic schools. They're, yeah, they're, they're both Islamic schools, yeah, in, in Minnesota. Um, I also taught at the, the Plymouth Community Center, um, both weekday, so weekday after school? school programming as well as weekend school. And then I taught at public school for about a year. So I, I have quite some experience in the education field. Um, I've been working on curriculum more right now. And so I'm, I'm not working with students currently, but I'm working on the STEM studies curriculum for the high school level. And I would say that I, I kind of worry for, you know, for Minnesotans that we don't really have a, a viable Islamic school option for our kids. I feel like the options that we have, you know, right now, Pioneer shut down. Um, the other school has their own limitations and, and struggles. So we'll, we'll see what happens. So, um, Ronya, you know, teaching at a, at a public school and teaching an Islamic studies school, how mm -hmm. or an Islamic school, how do how do you how can you explain the difference between in, in the children and the impact on the children, um, you know, comparing these two? What can you tell us about it? Um, can you repeat that again? So how the, the impact on the children when you look at a public school system and an Islamic mm -hmm. school system? Do you see that it, it has a big difference on them? Is it really worth it to pay $500, you know, a month compared to a public school? What do you think about that? That's a hard question. Um, I, I taught in public school for one year, and it was actually a, like a Christian charter school. And so when I taught at, at that school, it was all the way in Elk River. And I honestly felt like it resembled something in the family school because the kids were so conservative. And because it was a charter school, the parents were involved in, in keeping religious values in the school system. Like they, were, they wouldn't overtly say we're promoting Christian values, but the way that the school was set up, the way that the, the kids would dress, um, how they would, they would conduct their after school activities, it had like this, this air of, of religiosity that was similar to an Islamic, an Islamic school. And so I, I can't speak much about that, but I can say that with Islamic schools, I feel like if the curriculum is very strong, and you have qualified teachers, there's a, there's a, a lot to go for them um, to put your, your kids in those schools. So let me let me ask you this, uh, Ronya. Ronya, there are so many people out there that will say, you know, we know that in Islamic schools, we know lots of families that, that said that there were um, drug or let me call it akhlaq issues that happened in, uh, in an Islamic school, just in probably, um, some said, that it was probably even worse than a public school. So how is it different? Do you agree? Or are the Muslims ever going to be able to, you know, have a real Islamic school if the children anyways are exposed to all the different media things and most families are immigrant families unaware of the, the uh, unaware of the, the impact that uh, the media, the movies in that, that environment around them. So most of them think as long as I put my kids in Islamic school, I'm all set and ready to go. And yet at home, they're exposed to all the different movies, TikTok, the list goes on and on. Yeah, yeah. So do you agree with those people that say, well, the, the structure is probably in terms of in terms of management is different, but on ground, it's pretty much the same. Is that true? I don't think so, no. I, I think because you have, so you have Muslim adults in a Islamic school setting, and they have the, the full right to intervene in a child's life and to say, like, look, we, we draw the line right here. When I was, in, when I was teaching in public school, if, if students were cursing in the hallways, they were making out. If they were, if, you know, drugs, we, we could handle that, but there were some things that were going on that we could not stop in and say, you know, this is enough. Like, you have to give them a pass and say, like, well, so it's like, okay, it's permissible. We can't stop this behavior. We can't. We can't intervene. And so I feel like when you put your kids in a family school, like yes, it has its own issues. But in terms of like adults intervening and stepping in and and coaching kids and and giving them advice and helping them, you can at least do that. And I, I think there's a, there's a there's a benefit to knowing that if you have if you have Sadia in your own household, you can at least work with Muslim Muslim teachers and say like, look, we have these policies at home. Can you work with my child to do this at school? And so there's like a partnership that goes on where both parents and teachers that are Muslim can work together to cultivate that environment for students in the school setting. Mm -hmm. So you don't you don't get that in public school because public school you'll have you'll have parents that are concerned, but teachers might be like, "Look, I don't have the jurisdiction to intervene in this way as you're requesting." So mm -hmm. we have limits as teachers in public schools, whereas Islamic schools you can have that partnership going on. 
Lovely. So here's a question. Um, we have children at elementary and middle schools and haven't noticed a, an LGBTQ agenda as a part of the curriculum. Could someone please give me examples of how they've personally noticed the school teaching kids about LGBTQ um, things? Rania, did you want to answer that question? Can you repeat it one more time, please? We have children in elementary and middle schools and haven't noticed an LGBTQ agenda as part of the curriculum. Could someone please mm -hmm. give me examples of how they personally noticed the school teaching kids about LGBTQ? I can't speak to that. I'm sorry. My son is still too young to come to that. Sorry. I haven't okay. had a chance to interact with um, that kind of curriculum as of yet. So, um, I'd like to just one thing is that when we're talking about the the middle school and um in, in elementary schools now one thing is that it is part now I work as I work as a as a chaplain at St. Catherine University. It's not just in the university, but it is also in the schools and where the the in order to get the funding, even the public schools in order to get the funding, they will ask you to um, to have certain programs in where it is tolerant of an anti-bullying, etc. So the programs many times will come in different names in where it will be called anti-bullying, it will be called um, uh, inclusive, it will be called to teach diversity, it will be in different ways. So their, their family, uh, some classes are called family planning classes, some classes are basically called uh, uh, basically called inclusive classes or etc. Now those classes, those classes, through them they will basically always include that somebody can be white, somebody can be um, different color or different religion, and including somebody can be a different gender or express themselves uh, in, in different ways or feel that they are different. And the most important thing when we're talking about LGBTQ is 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 um, is pretty much the, in, that idea, the philosophy indoctrination that people have different ways of expressing themselves and that people and it although it sounds very harmless, you would it's like, OK, yeah, OK, people have different ways of expressing themselves. But then that building on that then it will be down in the sentence it would the the whole theme is really to get to that yes and you also have to tolerate that people can be biologically male and yet um socially um or at least they would express themselves with the pronoun she and that you have to you have to respect that and you have to work you have to um learn how to deal with it and then of course the different stories that are going to be taught in order the different stories in elementary or even um or even in in middle schools or even high schools is that to integrate to, to put that as part of the curriculum that it's in order to bring about that inclusive um, relationship among students to um, accept it and there are teachers that are actually part of the LGBTQ and therefore since they are teachers that are teaching that and therefore you would have them um, you know uh, you, without you realizing you're going to deal with it as this is a fact around me and that I have to accept it and and consider it that this is just a different way and then later on there you will have uh, different programs that are telling the children that it's okay to uh, that it's okay to um, feel different and that it's okay it, it's, although it sounds very innocent that it's okay to feel different but down uh, sorry I'm gonna mute you again uh, Ronya there's a background noise um, that it's okay to feel different, etc. But what it really is referring to is that you may have a female um, genitalia, but you can probably feel that you are male and that you there are different ways to realize. And that's why not only in schools, but even as pediatricians, they cannot tell them or advise them otherwise if they are telling, if 
the the children or even that system is telling them that yes you know you have to now or you do have the right this is exactly what it's being said is that you have the right to decide whether you would like to change your gender and whether you would like to perform certain surgeries or take certain medications or hormones in order to help you navigate who you really are. So it starts out, you know, sounding very innocent. It sounds very, um, it sounds very inclusive, but it is that indoctrination that we may not realize. Faiza, you wanted to say something. Yes. Um, I just wanted to add that, um, to when you ask the question of how are the schools going to be implementing or bringing in these ideas. Um, you know, I, I'm sure people realize that now they're making children's books about like, you know, having the same gender parents and it's just because they, they sub, subtly bring it in with like, they'll, they'll have stories and all. And I was told by one of my sisters that, um, the, the public libraries, the Hennepin County Library, they have, uh, gender, they have like gender awareness, uh, the story time with, for the little kids. And, and it's, I think it's like once a week, they'll read a, they'll read an LGBTQ, uh, story for little kids. Um, and I just wanted to share an experience that, I, that I had with, from, with my son, um, back in, I would say 2010, we lived in Champlain and he went to a school in the Anoka Hennepin School District and elementary school and he was in kindergarten. And, um, and this was back in 2010, so a decade ago. Uh, he, that, that, that community, Champlain has a very, um, from what I've experienced, has a very high, uh, transgender, uh, family, fam, there's a, there's plenty of these transgender families, um, uh, so in my, my son, when he was in kindergarten, one of the students in his class had, um, both of the parents or both of his guardians were women and they would actively come and volunteer in the classroom. And one day my son came to me and he said, he said, uh, mama, Alex has two moms. And can you imagine you're sitting there and your kindergartner comes to you and says, so-and-so has two moms. And I had to explain to him that, you no, know, um, you know, when, when they're in kindergarten, what do you even say? Like in terms of like, it's, you can't even explain the, uh, you have to basically say something like, no, they just, it's just somebody that's related to them lives with them. And she raises, uh, this, you know, she raises the student with his, with his real mom, but you know, like they're doing this, they're doing this in, in these terms. Like it's like subtly, like parenting, the parents will come in and these types of, of, of gender, uh, families, they actually are very active. They come and they volunteer and they come and, and, and this is, and I pulled him out of that district eventually, but they had a, it was, and he had, he also in a, in, in, uh, when he went to first grade, half of the year, he was there for first grade. There was another uh, student, a girl with two dads that they would say like she has two dads. So can you imagine what your kids are, are, are being exposed to? And it's, it's really, this is how, these are how these things that, that this agenda gets pushed in. Right. So there, they do, there is something called the drag queen, uh, drag queen, the dragon queen, um, toddler story time. I know that Hennepin County has that. And somebody mentioned, if you look online, this is, I'm quoting, if you look online, the WHO is pushing to, teach um, sex education and masturbation to children less than four. Um, and it, she also said in the UK, less than six were being taught that it is okay to experiment with their bodies and the parents were against yeah. it, but they were unable to opt out. So this is, this is real. This is the, this is not something that anybody is exaggerating about, but um, you can even, you can even see it as a culture in where you can't actually talk about or against it, but you have to tolerate all this culture that surrounds you. And if you dare say that this is not acceptable in my culture, you can be targeted with different labels, uh, being called homophobes, being called, um, probably targeted. And without you noticing the child himself, 
is not able to stand up for himself and actually be confident and say, well, this is against my identity as a Muslim. And they eventually start feeling that, no, I ha it sounds it, it sounds very, uh, what is the word, but it, 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 it sounds very attractive when you're promoting it. Okay. Um, when you're promoting it, it is being promoted. It's not almost. Um, it's being promoted in in ways where it's it's not necessarily just saying, well, this is how we practice it, but it is using the that promoting and the the uh, let me say the rhetoric in where it's being promoted as a way that is acceptable and is a way that it is, you know, go ahead and see it's, yeah, you, maybe you are different. Maybe you should navigate something different about yourself and here's how to do it. And for a child, when, you know, it's exactly like that manipulation that Iblis was doing. It's like, it's exactly like that in where in manipulative ways, it's actually being promoted and not necessarily just to say, well, you know, we do things differently and being quiet about it it's actually promoting it as a lifestyle and that's the that's the part that is uh dangerous happening in in public schools right now um aisha aisha marlin um i'll have you uh be the last person to speak just because it's almost um at the end of our time it actually did pass our time so aisha you wanted to say something um and here yes, ronia uh, wa alaikum salam go ahead um I'm a teacher myself, and I've taught both in Islamic school and public schools. Um, and one thing that I have noticed when I was working in in the public schools were that teachers, you know, homosexual teachers were openly discussing their personal, you know, marriage or relationship lives in front of students. And so I remember it was the first year that I was teaching at a public school, and they did not sit well with me. Um, we're, we're talking about constant exposure, um, having, you know, them having pictures of their spouses and whatnot in the classroom and kids can see it. It, it you know, as a Muslim, you know, as someone who grew up in this country, um, and then having kids of my own, um, it was very, very, very alarming to me. Um, I knew Muslim parents who had students, who had, um, students whose teachers were homosexual. And I felt, I, I felt, I don't know, a part of me felt obliged to tell them that, you know, I know you're bringing your child here for an education, but this is what's going on inside that you don't really, are not really cognizant of. Um, the other thing is that I was sitting with my children one day and I have a newborn and I give my two older ones a tablet. Um, it's an iPad. Um, it has a lot of like Islamic apps and um specific apps that only I download and my kids don't have the password to it. But I remember I, I put on this video and it was an educational video um, titled Story Time and it was a picture of the book. And I'm just, you know, I'm holding my youngest and I'm nursing her and then I was paying, Alhamdulillah, I was paying attention because I saw that the video was a drag queen reading stories to, reading off a book to children, I would say four to five years of age. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I'm just so thankful that my daughter, she's almost six, didn't catch it. She had no idea what was going on. She actually thought it was a, it was a, it was a woman that was reading the book. And um, at one point, you know, she's only six and she's, she's asking me, Mom, he's a man, why is he wearing makeup? And I'm like, how do I answer that? Sometimes, Allah, I don't like to go outside because I'm just like, I don't want her to see something. I don't want her to see, you know, two, you know a couple that's um, doing, you know, public, what is it called? Is it PDA or public uh, display affection? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. I'm just, yeah. just like constantly afraid of, you know, I don't want her to see something. And then for her to, because my daughter, she's, she's very observant, you know, and she's constantly asking me, what is this? Why is that? How come he's wearing a lipstick? And um, why is she, why is she holding a woman's hand? It's just like, I just want to know at this point, me, I, I came to this country when I was five, and I'm the youngest. My parents had 11 kids, and I'm the youngest. I came here when I was five. And right now, when I was grow, growing up in the U.S., and my daughter's time growing up in the U.S., it's like the East and West, right? So is it mandatory right now for us to make hijrah? That's, that's honestly what I'm thinking about. Like, is it wajib 
for us right now to leave this country, specifically for those who are able to, to just leave and and, and be like that. Are we are we being held accountable? I listened to a lecture where a sheikh said, um, you know, there are people whose first names are Muslims. I mean, like they have non-Muslim first names. Like you'll see um, Michael Michael Ahmed, for example, right? And then he he he's not Muslim, but he will say, oh my great great grandfather was Muslim, right? Uh, that that's scary to me because now it's like that great great grandfather came here. He had Islam. He had Aqidah. His son was probably Muslim. His son's son did not become Muslim. And then it's like the, the rest of the generations eventually will lose Islam and their Islamic identity altogether. Are we heading, may Allah, I, I don't want to say are we heading that path. May Allah prevent that from happening. But it's like, I feel like we're, we're, at, we're, at, we're at risk for that, right? This, is, this honestly gives me so much, so much anxiety. Wallahi, I'm like, I, I just, I'm like, I know my kids are six and two and four months old, but they grew up so quick and I don't know things are just going to get worse from here schools are just mandating the worst of things i'm seeing it i see teachers that are for it and i'm like i left public schools i'm like there's no way i can work in a setting like this because i was afraid for my own aqidah for my own iman you know right you know um unfortunately uh aisha you know these things are actually right now in 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 islamic countries as well I was in Kuwait and I was in Qatar a few months ago. And I'll tell you, these topics are pretty much the hot topics even in Islamic countries. And, you know, I was really surprised. I thought that, you know, in the U.S., I was actually looking to um, to probably leave the U.S. and go for an Islamic country. And I looked into Qatar, I looked into Palestine, and I looked into Kuwait. And I'll tell you, even in those countries, those are right now the hot topics. Those are the hot topics. And it, the indoctrination has gone worldwide. It's not just in the U.S. Um, I don't know about Somalia. Um, I don't know about, you know, different countries, but I'll tell you that this has become a world lobby, an um, international lobby. It's not only in, in, in the U.S. or in Western countries. So just to uh, mention that one. The other thing is that um, Rania responded um, to the issue of um, the, the public schools and, you know, how are they teaching the LGBTQ issues? And she said it's a categorical re rejection of binary genders and in, in any limitation on sexual uh, sexuality and sexual ex expression. So any type of limitation, wh anywhere that you're going to say this is masculine, this is feminine, even if it involves that activity, is actually considered that you are setting a certain definition to what is feminine, what is masculine, what is female, what is male, etc. Even if that involves a sexual activity and what it looks like is considered a type of discrimination, a type of, a type of discrimination. And therefore, um, you're not respecting people's sexual orientation. That's the term that is right now used. So in our system today, in that postmodern society that we're in today, there's a total rejection of anything that that has any limit, any boundary, any definition. Everything is supposed to be relative, even if we're talking about male, female. And the second that you say otherwise, you will be subject to being called out a homophobe or probably called out as as um, uh, judgmental or not res or uh, not tolerating other people's views, etc. And then you can end up. Uh, you know, you can end up um, not only losing your job, but if you dare say anything else. I've had one time I was in a conference and a and a and a teacher from uh, teacher from uh, from California told me that she was expected to always include whenever she's talking about any topic even though she was an English teacher she was she had to include the uh, some some uh, gender tolerance um, stories just to make sure that other people are being included even though this is the very very minority even if uh, we do mention that but right now focusing on that as a minority in order under the pretense that it's to prevent bullying is right now the the standard so I'm going to go for Zainab Jazakallah Khairan um, uh, Aisha um, Zainab sister Zainab you wanted to add something so go ahead 
and uh, even though I said Aisha was going to be the last, so I, I'll make that. I'll make you the last. Go ahead, sisters. I know. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you, everyone, for like everything that you shared. Um, I mean, like the solution that has been given is a hope, but also it's a business because there is a business opportunity here for any sister who doesn't have a job. So if you couldn't see it, text me. I will tell you what it is. And my last thoughts is this. Moms or future moms, sister, whatever who you are, the threat is real on the Ummah, in our kids, in our Muslim kids, in our innocent children. And it's not COVID-19. Stop getting distracted that it's COVID-19. The kids being at home after COVID-19 is a blessing. Because at That's least true. now you can hear, the, ch you can hear the, the teacher, what they're teaching your kids through that laptop, through that computer. And you can run and say to your child, tell them, well, I heard the teacher say this or that or that. And I hope if you're not doing that, to start doing it, to start listening to that conversation that the child is listening through that computer that he's taking from the education. And also, this is the amazing thing that surprised me. If your child has a physical illness, and he need intensive care to watch his insulin, what time you're giving it to him, how much is the doses, what he's eating, how much calories to balance that. If your child need oxygen and you always need to change the tube and clean that, I swear you will go and be a nurse to take care of your child. But I do not understand why you could not figure out that something more important than the physical body is in danger. The soul of your child is in danger. The mind of your child is in danger. And still, you are being arrogant and selfish to say, me first. There is moms who dropped everything in their hand to take care of their own child. They drop up their career to take care of their child when he's sick physically. But why can't you do the same thing to save his soul? Listen to me, sisters. I am afraid of time when we moms will be only considered as a birth machine. We give birth, they come, they take it. And then you will be just watching your child in front of your eyes going to Jahannam and you cannot do nothing about it. So please wake up now. Put your priorities right. And even if you still keep doubting and rethinking, remember one thing. Allah will ask you. You made a dua to give you a child. And I did. I trusted him in your hand. What did you do? Oh, I was making the dua, may Allah guide him. Well, you need to reframe what is the meaning of Allah guide him. Because it means as long as you're still alive, you are the tool to guide that child. You are the tool to keep that child in Islam and in his right faith. And if you're not going to do that, then Allah will take your soul or he will take him away from you. So think about that. What it means really, may Allah guide my child, is that mean that you relax and you wait for Allah to send him the wind and send him Jibreel, is the one who is teaching him? So please, sisters, start teaching and protecting your kids. I'm not a mom, and I swear, I am so boiled up. I am just a teacher. All I am doing is I'm teaching kids, and I am so boiled up. You, you have to teach your t kids. You can't be a Muslim and do something that Allah did not approve. And teach that yourself as well, too. And understand that deep inside your heart. And another thing, teach your kids what they need to do 
with their own kids when the time come. Don't just like save them now. You have to have already teaching your kids what they need to do with the next generation that is coming. What solutions are there? Prepare them to start thinking already with the burden of the ummah. Prepare them to already start to care about the other people that they're growing up with. The other Muslims, uh, what we're going to do here as a minority. What your rule is going to be here. Are we going to teach your kids to be the ones who's going to open a charter school that has majority Muslims so we can control what is teach that? Where you are teaching your kids to go to work just to have a job and make income, what is the rule in the Ummah? Right. So, Sister um, Zainab, just because out of time, um, yep. I will wa also want to say, say something. Yep, I'm, I'm going to let you um, just give me a second, um, Najat. So, um, Sister Ronya was also uh, pointing out that in public schools, they do have what is called counseling services that are often pro provided for the LGBTQI plus and there are inclusion workshops to teachers and students so there are so many different different workshops that they will do for that uh, and uh, and of course they make visits to classrooms and read about discuss LGBT gender fluid ideas in a promotional way and this is a, I mean I work at at um at a, a Catholic university and I've seen I've seen that myself in where there's always always that promotional way that you won't necessarily realize that it is promotional um but it does actually if if you look at the language it is nothing but promotional so it's not just laying out and there are um, they're called workshops, they're called inclusion workshops, they're called to, you know, um, include others, be respectful, tolerance, etc. But in reality, it's an agenda. So, um, Sister Najat, go ahead, Sister Najat. So, thank you for, uh, Zina, for inviting me for this uh, wonderful meeting. I had the, um, I did enough research about everything that's going on. And like you said, it's an agenda. Unfortunately, we have to be careful about what our um, kids watch on TV, what they see, even Disney, even like I don't allow my child to watch anything that's not Arabic unless I watch what it is. If it's Shrek, if it's anything, there is an agenda in there. If it's a Shrek movie, she saw something in there about um about adults kissing each other and she came to me telling me about it and so we really have to be careful because there is a real agenda down there and if you ladies heard about a movie called cuties it's about girls uh, that are 11 years old and one of them is she's a muslim who is a rebellion on her muslim family so what whatever you we expose our children to they're gonna be open to it whether what whether we want or not and i honestly other than that, I want to say also that yeah, of it being an agenda, the goal here is to take our kids from us, indoctrinate them against us, and a true satanic agenda. I'm sorry if I'm talking really open, but this is what's going on. It's from the schools, it's from the, the, the child services, it's from, if you go to child services, the goal is to take their, your kids away from you, and I'm sorry if I'm deviating. We really have to be careful. And right now in Corona, everything is in the open. And the goal down the line is to allow pedophilia, not, not just teach them about this gender, whatever. Sorry, that's in school. So there is a lot of stuff going on. I don't know how to protect my child other than trying to teach her about Islam. There is only so much we can control Zainab. As a working parent, I am unable and uh, a woman who's um, down the line gonna be a single mom. I don't know how I'm going to protect my child 24 seven. I cannot leave my job. I cannot, I have to provide for uh, for living for myself and my, and my family. And if I go home, I'm gonna do the best I can. What else can we do as working parents to protect our children? There is only so much we can do. It's very angering and I, feel sometimes very powerless, but I think I feel okay because I'm not the only one. So that's all I have to say, and thanks for everyone for listening. Um, so somebody shared an article 
um, and Ronya, she shared an article and she suggested that this should be um, shown is that education is one thing, but the mainstream and the popular media is another beast that is actually taking over. And that this is actually very dangerous. And it's really important for us to know, which is that we're getting different programs that are indoctrinating the children in indoctrinating the children from early childhood in to talk about different um, to talk about different things and it appears it's like a joke it appears like it's just a an innocent uh, children's show and in reality there's actually a lot more to it and um, I, I'm, I'm not going to play this I've seen it before the trailer and it was it was very shocking to me so I'll just let you for those that would like to see it it's on uh, you can actually read the article and although Netflix uh, did, uh, um, I guess in some areas did apologize, but in the end is that, you know, it doesn't, it, they will, they won't stop at that. They will not stop at that. This is an agenda. It's going to continue and it will not stop until it goes farther than LGBTQ. It will go for pedophilia mm -hmm. and you bestiality, everything. It will not stop at anything. Once you don't have a limit and once you reject that there is a limit and there is a principle, then that means there is no principle and there is no limit. So as a Muslim, you got to be careful and make sure that you don't put your children in those circles and think, well, I just want to pave away a future for them. What future is more important than Jannah? And what future is more important than actually being on piety? This is... This is going to be the first and most important priority that you teach in your children and that you teach your children, which to, which is to help them get to the purpose that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created them for. So um, I know um, I, I keep saying this is going to be the last person, so um, I will, inshallah, have to end. I'm so sorry, but I don't, I, we are already past um, an hour and 36 minutes, but I will... How about we continue this topic again next Thursday? Um, and inshallah, we'll continue it next Thursday because it's a very important topic and we won't be um, able to end it uh, end it um, today. So, uh, Jazakumullah Haran, everyone, for attending. Faiza, you wanted to say something, so go ahead. Last, la no. one minute. No. 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 I'm so sorry, Faiza, but you're really breaking. The sound was really breaking, so I had to mute you because it was causing lots of um, sound pollution. So, Jazakumullah khairan, everybody, and Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.